All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to listen to this presentation by um, Ed Mills, the leader of the Together trial. He is running an adaptive trial, a large adaptive trial that was looking at um, repurposed medications for um, COVID-19. So he tested um, in the first round, he tested hydro hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir. Those were found to be not helpful. And he's currently testing ivermectin and fluvoxamine and metformin. And this is a presentation that he gave um, a few days ago. Um, and so I haven't watched this. Let's um, look at it together and I'll give commentary where I can. In New Jersey with Sertara. Um, you know, everybody wanted to do what they could when COVID first struck. And uh, some people were, you know, uh, public workers. They were the people who went to the grocery, uh, that worked in the grocery store, the fast food workers. Everybody did what they could. And those of us working in clinical research, we did what we could too. But you know, the streets of uh, hell are paved with uh, good intentions. And what we've ended up with is a real mishmash of the quality of utility, let's say usability of clinical trials. So uh, there have been almost 3,000 clinical trials that have been registered on clinicaltrials.gov for uh, the treatment of COVID, the evaluation of treatments of COVID. Over half of them uh, intend to recruit 100 patients or less. The median sample size across all trials is 100. And despite being small individually, these trials collectively um, add up to over 74,000 patients. Those small trials add up to 74,000 patients. And if we look at trials, uh, you know, the, the um, redundancy of many of these trials, we look at hydroxychloroquine, for example, which I think most of us are done with. It. We don't need to talk about it again. Uh, in a hospitalized setting only, uh, there are, you know, almost 5,000 patients that have been randomized into these very small, unusable trials, which is about three times the size of the end that was required for the recovery trial when they evaluated hydroxychloroquine and determined it didn't have a role within this population, that is the hospitalized patients. So individually, these small trials are not meaningful. Collectively, I think they represent kind of a reflection on where we are. There are efforts to make sense of all of these small trials, and there's uh, efforts such as ICODA and uh, you know the the uh, workbench, different organizations who are trying to post hoc make sense of these uh, small trials and and trials that fail to recruit where they uh, the the number that they anticipated, but really none of that has come out very well. So a lot of this is a reflection of research waste. Okay, so basically, this is the problem with, um, you know, all these studies that we were done, and they're they're very small, so most of them are under a hundred, and um, you know, uh, the like three quarters of them are under two fifty. These are really small trials. It's really hard to get enough um, recruitment to find any differences, and like ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, a lot of these people did hundreds of these small trials but they're just not powered enough to give good information and you can try to combine them with meta-analyses and system systematic reviews but really they're they're hindered by like having inconsistent um inclusion criteria exclusion criteria what their primary and secondary endpoints are how they measure the endpoints they're just all different so it's really hard to combine them so what he's saying is post hoc analysis trying to analyze like kind of this data from lots of small trials and trying to combine them it just doesn't work there's too many confounding factors um so what you need to do is you need to we what he's saying is these 74,000 participants, if we could have recruited them into large trials with agreed upon inclusion, we would have nailed down the answers a long time ago. You know, good intentions, but research waste. When I think about the trials that gave us some findings that are useful, there is a pattern to them. If I think about remap cap, which was perhaps the, the, the uh, should go down in history as one of the most important uh, clinical trials. The reason I say that is the platform trial, we'll get to platform trials in a moment. Remap cap was going on before uh, COVID struck. Uh, it was for community based, uh, sorry, community acquired pneumonia. However, they had the foresight to put into their appendices that should a respiratory pandemic occur, they had already built into their uh, adaptive design what they should do on that to expand recruitment. 
I don't know how they could see into the future the way that they could, but I think remap cap will go down as an example of how future clinical trials should be planned. Of course, we know about solidarity uh, from many different countries that was coordinated by WHO. The recovery trial, which has probably given us the most useful information from the UK, evaluated many different interventions now, some work, some don't. It's been the one that we could have started giving us the earliest useful information about interventions that do work. The principal trial, also from the, uh, the Oxford group led by Chris Butler. The principal group is looking at ivermectin right now. Uh, you know, sophisticated trial in terms of uh, the populations that they, inter in, that they are able to recruit and the simplicity with which they can recruit as well. Uh, so the principal trial has given us the recent finding on inhaled budesonide uh, being effective in outpatient trials, uh, a, one of the most important findings of this year. And then the TOGETHER trial, which I'll talk about today, which we led originally in Brazil and South Africa. South Africa, the numbers dropped off, and so we have focused on the engine of recruitment, which has really been in Brazil. The pattern of all of these is that they are all platform adaptive trials. And so they all have an overarching master, pro, what are called master protocol, where you in where you plan or you try to plan for circumstances you are not yet sure what will happen, but you're planning for the long term about possible changes that are going to occur. And uh, you uh, are planning to evaluate many different interventions over a long term. So master protocols are the overarching term. And within that, you have different types of trial designs. And the one that, that I just mentioned, those trials fit best under the, the category of platform trials. Uh, master protocols are being promoted. For example, uh, Janet Woodcock from FDA, uh, wrote an article a couple of years ago uh, in New England Journal about master protocols, and this has been advocated in NIH and FDA. I'll be honest with you, I don't think that the understanding of what master protocols is is, uh, is currently widely uh, well interpreted. I have been a reviewer on proposals where people have been asked to submit uh, grant applications on master protocols, and what I've been observing are not master protocols, they're just kind of a mishmash of different ideas. So I think we still have a long way to go. Regardless, I do think people can understand platform trials quite well. And platform trials, in their simplest way, are multi-armed trials where you can add or drop according to whether or not uh, an intervention is displaying an effect that the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Committee or the principal investigators, uh, the, sorry, the investigative team, believes is worth pursuing or, or worth dropping. So the simplest way is for the multi-armed I want to give you a few ideas here about where I think that the future of clinical trials should be going, and certainly the future of investments in clinical trials. One of those ideas is, is something dear to my heart, and that is the idea of building infrastructure on clinical trials and not walking away from that infrastructure once you've answered. Okay, I think you're going to just talk about different questions. types of clinical trials, which is kind of um, interesting, trials. but probably not what we're really interested in. We want to know the results of this together and trial. Training people for trial recruitment. So I'm going to fast forward here. He's talking about different types of platform trials. Plat he, together is a platform trial where he is consistent. He's got a metric for success and failure, and he's going to test multiple drug interventions in, in a predetermined manner and add and drop interventions as needed. Engagement. So let's, let's see where he starts talking about. And see where he starts talking about um, the results of his trial. Okay, here we go. I'm going to back up a little bit. All right, here we go. Uh oh, did I kill it? In Brazil, I mentioned it started out in South Africa, and uh, now now predominantly in Brazil, or all all in Brazil at the moment. But we we uh, began with the two countries. It's a randomized adaptive platform trial. We're looking at repurposed medicines. That's what, we, what we've been looking at since we began this trial on June 2nd, a year ago. Uh, we have ethics approval in Brazil and also in Canada. Uh, we did in South Africa when it was relevant. And we have an overarching data safety monitoring committee who provide independent oversight. They're the ones who make the decisions. The drug you're going to be most interested in, at least I hope that you're going to be most interested in today, is fluvoxamine, the antidepressant, and the repurposed use of that. Because it had been pre previously- It looks like they started in January. Uh, positive out outcomes 
in the JAMA publication. They're talking about from January we to August. We began enrollment on that about six months ago. So it's in sent form. We have tried to be as transparent as possible with our trial. And we look forward to engaging with any decision makers uh, who want to um, evaluate the trial. We've done this in the context of industry standards. So we engage with organizations like uh, it, contract research organizations like CITEL and MMS. Uh, 15 or 16 different. Okay, sites. so he's talking about where they're recruiting from. Most of these patients are from Brazil. So that's kind of okay. So here's your inclusion criteria a known comorbidity for COVID. And you'll see a list of them there. They're the usual ones so obesity, cardiovascular, diabetes, etc. We have a variety of exclusion criteria, uh, but these are really just uh, exclusion criteria, either specific to the drug and known adverse events. Um, or for people that we thought might not be able to uh, manage picking up the phone and filling out the, the uh, sheets if they were required to. So in general, it's a, a very broad inclusion. For randomization, uh, we did this uh, block randomization. Randomization, uh, uh, they get randomized to either the active intervention or to a matched placebo. Because of the number of interventions that we've got in our trial, we have uh, different placebo groups that are get pulled together and we determine whether or not there's a difference. So, for example, one of the intervent, you know, fluvoxamine, we have a matched placebo, which is a talcum powder um, made pill. But we have another active intervention, which is subcutaneous injection, and we need to create a placebo for the subcutaneous injection. And we consider them all a placebo group, but we specifically note when, when uh, the interventions began because we tried to use the controls also as concomitant. Some of you will be familiar with a paper that was in New England Journal a few weeks ago, and it talked about problems in platform trials. They appear to use the historic, too much of a historic control group. Mm -hmm. I think I do agree. Yeah, so they're trying to make general. sure that the placebo group um, is so treated at the same time as the intervention group, which makes sense. Um, control group. That is, if, for example, fluvoxamine. When the mm -hmm. fluvoxamine patients were randomized and there were people were randomized to the control of that, that's when we start using the placebo data. And the reason for that is that you, you will find that there are fluctuations in the event rates. If you think back to the very earliest time of right, because there are going to be different uh, variants, COVID, different uh, if you uh, were even treatments. mildly symptomatic yeah. with COVID, or you you know um, you were uh, so somewhat sense. concerning, often you would get hospitalized. Well, nowadays that's quite a different scenario. You may not get the same person may not get hospitalized, and if our outcome is hospitalization, which it will be in this, then uh, if we if we use control group that goes back too far, it is possible that the control group no longer represents. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. He was saying that the criteria for hospitalization has changed throughout the course of this uh, pandemic. So um, if your endpoint is hospitalization, then the endpoint changes as time goes on. So the placebo group has to be at the same time. This is one of the other reasons that these all these small trials, you can't gather them together because, you know, they're done at different times in different places. And these little factors are different. So it's hard to interpret the data and pull them together. Of what we have today. So it's a very valid. Um, uh, so we stratified according to clinical site, according to age, we try to create balance. And of course, the, the looks like up until right now. The first time that we did randomization, we have our outpatient population been through the inclusion exclusion criteria. And we randomized patients to hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, or placebo. And then in September of last year, we did an interim analysis and we found that the drugs were not providing any benefit whatsoever over placebo. So both of those have dropped. Then we started again and we randomized to placebo, or ivermectin, or metformin, or fluvoxamine. We did an interim analysis at some point, and there was a couple of interim, uh, interim analyses that went on, and we decided to drop metformin. It wasn't showing any effect. I'll, I'll get into results for, for these different drugs in, in a moment. We kept ivermectin going because it is such a topic of um, worldwide interest. So it, uh, it was not showing a large treatment effect, but we, the DSMB felt that to influence guidelines, the, the enthusiasm on ivermectin uh, needed to be matched by evidence that could either um, refute or uh, agree with the enthusiasm. Yeah, 
Yeah, so he's saying that when they did the interim analysis in April, ivermectin didn't show a very large effect, but because there's so much interest in it, they figured that they needed more evidence and they kept the trial going for ivermectin because they felt like because of the amount of interest in ivermectin, they needed really strong evidence to say, yes, it works or no, it doesn't work or how much it does work. Um, because with, with small enough numbers, there will be some distractors. So they wanted just really ironclad data, which makes sense. And then fluvoxamine. So by the April 13th, we had dropped metformin, and then we subsequently have entered two new drugs. So we went from three arms to four arms. We're now five arms this week, which is placebo, ivermectin, fluvoxamine, doxazepin, and interferon, the, the subcutaneous interferon lamp. As of today, we're going to be dropping fluvoxamine um, based on the outcome that I present to you. We'll also be dropping ivermectin. And our hope is to add new interventions uh, in, the next, in the next little while. Um, our, uh, because we're going from... Okay, so they're done, actually. They're done with fluvoxamine and ivermectin. So this is, this is the end. Okay, this will be good. Uh, we went from three to four, in, four arms to five arms. And now we're dropping down to three again this week. If we do drop, for example, one of the interventions after addition. So just as I mentioned, we started with three, then it went to four. And as you can see, um, we, we currently- Okay, so they were testing low dose and high, high dose ivermectin. ivermectin. Great. Currently. Because, you know, some people, if you did the low dose thing and you stop, people would be like, well, you just didn't use a high enough dose. So they're going with a higher dose, which is uh, very good. At least this week. The outcomes that are of interest to us were uh, the primary outcome is a composite of either hospitalization for COVID-related uh, disease or for emergency room visits, wherein the physician is so concerned about the patients that they retain them for observation or treatment greater than six hours. And we felt that these were valid, a valid composite. You can look at them individually, but for the purpose of power, we put them together as a composite. Secondary endpoints were you know, clinical worsening, uh, quality of life, mortality, well, specific hospitalization, our load, uh, different symptoms and adverse events, a lot of this is usual. But I do think that this issue of what outcomes to choose in different COVID trials is not yet resolved. And it's probably one of the unfortunate aspects of us doing trials when we have had to socially distance and not getting into a room and arguing out I, I will illustrate this to you by um, indicating that the principal trial in the UK, for example, they, their primary endpoint, wherein they stopped the budesonide, was based on time to recovery. Our primary endpoint is whether or not you get worse and require hospitalization or emergency care greater than six hours. Others have done things like whether or not your SPO2 drops below a threshold and whether or not you regain past that threshold. All of these have their strengths and weaknesses. And in the COVID cl clinical trial environment right now, we don't have a resolution of what's the best one. And I will also indicate to you that they're not highly correlated. So I personally like hard outcomes, dichotomous outcomes that have either got better or, it, you know, you, you, sorry, uh, you either got worse requiring hospitalization or you didn't. It either happened or it didn't. But if we were to look at things on you know, number of days in hospital, for example, which is used in the inpatient clinics. You are, you are using a continuous outcome. Well, if you're using a continuous outcome, you have a better likelihood of spuriously detecting a significant effect than if you had used a binary outcome. And so uh, I don't have an answer for you on what is the best outcome to choose. I'm, He's basically I'm just discussing inferring types of statistical data. NIH, different organizations, it would really be useful if we could come to some consensus about what are the best outcomes to choose so that going forward, different trials can at least capture those different outcomes in, you know, for a primary or secondary. We also collected uh, the uh, SPO2. So data collection, you get randomized on, uh, you know, you get assessed and you're randomized on day one to the intervention or not. We collect very detailed symptoms up to day seven. Uh, day 10, we collect those same questionnaires, uh, day 14, and day 28. 28 is our primary endpoint. 
we collect viral load at baseline at day three and at day seven. We don't go beyond that. There's a number of reasons for that, but most people will clear their viral load at some point around day seven anyway. If you think that the inclusion criteria was you had to be symptomatic, uh, if, it, if by the time you were symptomatic and you add an extra seven days onto that, chances are you're going to have um, uh, yeah, cleared the viral load, if, particularly if you're, not, if you're not really very sick. We are following people up to day 60 because we want to know about long COVID um, and we'll see what, where, where that lands. We haven't done that evaluation yet. And uh, we're collecting all of the data as per standards to, uh, adverse events. We're using an electronic data capture system, which I think creates new challenges with all of the adding new interventions and taking interventions out of uh, your electronic data capture system within these platform trials. I think also there isn't yet a resolution on what gets considered a protocol change within the electronic data capture system uh, versus, you know, conventionally, you don't make a change in the trial. And so this just doesn't come up. And what I have found over the course of this trial is that the real challenges to doing this trial are not things that anyone talks about in the major medical journals. It's not methodological challenges. It's not even analytic challenges. It's the challenges of unexpected changes um, in things like the data capture form. And then you're dealing with a third party, IBM runs that, for example, and you're trying to convince them to make a change where that would be unconventional for them. So in terms of recruitment over time, I mentioned to you that in general, we recruit about 35 to 50 patients at a, in a day. Um, Okay, and he's just going to go over the methods. I think his methods are sound and that looks good. If we look at the uh, a paper we published in JAMA Network, okay, he's talking about the first ago, round of his trial, trial. We found no effect whatsoever, whatsoever of hydroxychloroquine or the uh, combination with pinavir with Lutonavir, which is Kalitra, on the outcome of uh, hospitalization or extended emergency care. It just didn't seem to make any difference. The way that we've presented it here is from uh, the graphics that JAMA uh, utilizes, and so that's what you'll see there. Um, 685 patients randomized among three arms, no, no indication of uh, benefit. Metformin, um, we also found no indication of benefit, maybe a slight benefit towards placebo, but obviously that's furious. So we discontinued that after, you know, 400 and 23 patients. Okay, so this trial has ruled out three medications. Metformin or placebo. And the, the logic behind metformin was that there were lots of observational studies that had been published showing that people were on metformin, diabetic patients were already on metformin, uh, were not dying of COVID. And so several people have made the assumption that if that's the case, then maybe it's a good intervention to try. We try it in this outpatient clinic and it made no effect whatsoever. Yeah, so there were lots of trials saying that metformin seemed to do better, but when tested in a large randomized trial, it did not work. So uh, it may well be that metformin, uh, when you've been on it for a long period of time, offers a benefit, but using it in the acute setting didn't make any difference. Okay, ivermectin, this is a tale that gets an awful lot of dark web and media attention and uh, come a topic I don't enjoy. Uh, we started out in January last, uh, at the beginning of this year, randomizing to the usual dose of ivermectin, which is a uh, single dose, the, the, the one used for uh, arbocoriasis, versus a single dose matched placebo. We got an awful lot of kind of criticism that that is not going to work and we should be doing multi-day dosing. So we increased it then, we made an adaptation. And, uh, some weeks later, we changed it to uh, three days of dosing, ivermectin at 400 micrograms per kilogram, and uh, three days of that. And um, we followed the patients up. We recruited, uh, you know, 1,500 patients, for example, in that aspect of the trial. And we found that it had no effect whatsoever on our primary outcome, the uh, um, positive ER observation or hospitalization and the relative risk on that was 0.91, confidence intervals 0.69 to 1.19. When you look at mortality relative risk, it was a, um, a relative risk 0.082, 44 to 152. So in our specific trial, outpatient, 
we do we do not see the uh, treatment benefit that a lot of advocates believe should have been. Okay, so what he's saying is the way to interpret this relative risk is that there so it's like if they're exactly the same it would be one and so if metformin's a little bit i mean if ivermectin is a little bit better this will go to zero like zero means that it's like 100 percent effective at at stopping the endpoint which means it protects 100 percent of people from from dying or going to the hospital so for for hospitalization is 0.91 which means there was a nine percent improvement so nine nine percent of people did not get hospitalized or have to go to the er which seems, you know, it's not great, but um, um, it's something. But their their confidence interval goes from 0.7 to 1.19. So that means um, it could be, and if it's larger than one, it means it actually hurts you. Um, and then you see the confidence interval for mortality uh, bridges one. So basically, it's not a very strong, uh, it's not a very strong data to support it. Um, you could say if there's a trend towards slight improvement, but it's not, um, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not statistically significant. So, Suvatsumi, I'm hoping I can leave you with something to really think about today. And I, what I see as potentially good news. Let me begin by saying that uh, 10 days worth of fluvoxamine, which is the, the uh, dosing that we used in our study, 200 uh, milligrams per day, well, a dose to talk, so 100 milligrams in the morning, 100 milligrams at night. Uh, 10 days of that cost $4. And so if, it's if, really cheap. Our findings, $4. Uh, if you are in agreement with our findings, we have an intervention here which provides potentially a very uh, large treatment effect uh, at a very low cost. So we have 742 patients up to this week in fluvoxamine and 738 patients in the placebo. Now, as I mentioned to you, this is up to this week, and we needed to do our final interim analysis on this. So we have patients randomized up until the DSMB issued a letter. That letter was issued last night, provided today then. So we would discontinue any further patients receiving this uh, intervention today. Um, and then we have to follow up patients for another 28 days because the primary endpoint is 28 days. And so I'm presenting to you these preliminary findings that I don't believe are going to change very much, but the exact numbers will almost certainly change a little bit. And, uh, we're waiting. So we have, uh, for our primary outcome, so requirement hospitalization or greater than okay. six hours in the emergency room, we find a 99.6% probability that fluvoxamine is superior over placebo. Okay. That is on the That's patients crazy recruited good. up until today, because we know that they had, if we know if they had an outcome, we simply don't know if they are not going to have an outcome over, the, over their 28 day follow up. So on the primary outcome, assuming that, uh, you know, this time to event analysis, essentially, then we have a absolute uh, relative risk reduction of four and a half percent. Um, relative risk uh, is displayed in the next slide. A relative risk of 0.69 confidence intervals, 0.52 to 90. Okay, so let's look at this in comparison to the ivermectin. This is 0.69, so this means like 31% were helped by the the thing, and you see the confidence intervals go from 0.5 to 0.91. So they are almost positive that it's helping. They don't know if it's helping a little bit, like 0.9, or helping a lot, like half, half the people, but it's definitely helping. Whereas the um, other data, it crossed one, so it could be hurting them a little bit or helping them a little bit. So a 31% relative risk reduction in hospitalization or retention in emergency care for observation. If we look at this from another couple of different angles, we see that the the findings remain very consistent. So if we look at only those patients who contribute the entire time period that they're supposed to, the findings don't change at all. For mm -hmm. those patients who only have, uh, who, who contribute. Okay, so that's good. And we say, well, I don't know. So these are the people they have longer follow-up follow on, which is a smaller number of patients, but the results are the same. We did consider that. Uh, what if you, we look and we exclude patients who had an event within the first day of treatment, the findings actually improved a little bit, 
Um, and we find a relative risk of 0.65 or confidence interval 0.48.87. Yeah, that's very consistent results. We look at secondary outcomes. We were not powered for mortality, but the findings are really quite um, consistent in terms of the direction of effect. So relative risk of 0.71, confidence intervals wider. Okay, so this is not statistically significant, but because you see the range is huge, 0.39 to 1.29, but the thing is, so they're saying they can't say for sure that it helps with mortality. Yes, they can say with one. good certainty that it helps with hospitalization. But um, if they had enough patients, if they gathered more patients, probably this would become statistically significant, the mortality. So it doesn't mean it doesn't help mortality. It just means that they were not powered to, to say for sure. Viral load. Also, as expected, we did not show a difference between um, between the groups. Um, not I wouldn't enough. make any inference off of this because we don't expect to show a difference on the test. Whether uh, they were on fluvoxamine or placebo, we also show you know findings that are consistent with our primary endpoint. So these numbers are going to be smaller than our primary endpoint um, because these are the ones who just got hospitalized and not the ones who are referred to as. Uh, being retained in the emergency setting. And so we, we see that we have. So it does seem to help improve um, length of stay and um, and ventilatory support, less ventilatory support. But of course it was not powered, so there it's not statistically, it's not significant, but it has a tendency. The only thing they have that's statistically significant that they've basically proven is um, that it does help with hospitalization and worsening of disease. And it probably helps with ventilation. It probably helps with um, mortality, but they can't say for sure. Um, hospitalization, they spend okay, let's, let's go. Prevents this to hospital with that synthesis. Okay. Oh, okay, so it looks like he's, he's done. So that. Okay, uh, public forum. Okay. Yeah, you were hearing it for the first. All right, so that wasn't too long, actually. I thought this was the whole hour was gonna was gonna be about that. All right, so very interesting. Um, I think that that is a large trial with almost two thousand patients um, that shows that basically ivermectin has a very small effect, if 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 any, and that uh, on the order of like single digit percentages, um, and that this fluvoxamine is about. 30%, it helps about 30%, which is good. It's not earth shattering, but it's good. I mean, and it's very cheap. It's $4 for the entire treatment course. That's extremely cheap. So if for $4 for the treatment course, and it's a relatively safe, well-known drug, it, if it saves 30% of the people from getting worse, um, probably worth doing. All right, well, thanks for watching this with me. That was pretty interesting. Um, What's going to be interesting is that the principal trial that he mentioned early on, they're looking at ivermectin right now, and the FLCC uh, C group was touting that the principal trial was looking at ivermectin. So if the principal trial also shows that ivermectin has a minimal effect, I think um, basically we have two large good trials that have looked at it, and um, we can probably close the door on that. Um, if the principal trial shows some effect, then I think you will probably need like a kind of a tiebreaker trial um, to decide if there is some effect. But uh, we should be awaiting the results of the principal trial, which hopefully will come out in a, uh, a month or two. And um, we'll kind of have the final answer, hopefully, on ivermectin. But this fluvoxamine seems very promising. Um, uh, given what I know now, if I got COVID, I, I might be looking at taking that, actually. All right, well, thanks for watching with me. If you enjoyed the video, please uh, like and subscribe below. Have a good night.